Welcome to Dale Borglum's Healing at the Edge. We are very happy to share with you Dale's profound insight and open heart. Please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Dale to support this podcast. Hi, welcome to the podcast. My name is Chris Britt, and I am a performer, a magician, a workshop leader. I like to blend everything I've brought into my life through uh, wellness and embodiment and meditation and magic and entertainment and synthesize it in a way that I can make offerings that are useful to people during this time. So that's about me. If you're interested in me as as you listen to into this and at the end, my website is chrisbritt.com. That's B-R-I-T-T dot com. And Dale? Thank you. I'm Dale Borglum. I'm the director of the Living Dying Project. I've known Chris for, I don't know, five years maybe. And this is the third podcast we've done together in this particular series, although we did a few earlier, maybe almost a year ago now, I think. Right. Uh, my podcasts are on the Be Here Now Network, which this one will find its way there, I hope. And I really enjoy working with Chris because He's got such a great sense of humor, and he's magical. <laughs> and Dale, I I, uh, I have learned a lot from you over the years, and I'm really looking forward to this as a conversation to to continue to articulate what what I think about these topics. And the topic that you and I decided to cover today is the shadow and the beloved. So. You want me to start in on that, or do you want? To, I thought you had a few things you wanted to read from a couple of books to kind of start the conversation yeah. going. Let's do that. So, there's a wonderful book, although a hundred thousand other purchasers of the book, "Owning Your Own Shadow: Understanding the Dark Side of the Psyche" by Robert A. Johnson, have got gotten to this book before me. This has been one of the best books I've read in the past few months. It's about the concept of the shadow. And Robert A. Johnson was a Jungian analyst. So there's a lot of really entertaining and thought-provoking parts of this. I'll read a little bit from the introduction, and maybe we'll return back to this in a bit. So the shadow. What is this curious dark element that follows us like a Saurian tail and, and pursues us so relentlessly in our psychological world? What role does it occupy in the modern psyche? The persona is what we would like to be and how we wish to be seen by the world. It is our psychological clothing and it mediates between our true selves and the environment, just as physical clothing presents an image to those we meet. The ego is what we are and know about consciously. The shadow is that part of us that we fail to see or no, welcome the shadow. The shadow knows <laughs> what lurks in the hearts of men. That's an old, old It's an old show. radio show back from when I was a kid. And I think they said only the shadow knows. Maybe oh. I'm wrong, but I mean, I remember driving in a car with my dad when I was a little kid and he had, a, he had the AM radio there or we driving through Chicago at night and he would play these mystery shows it was like so uh, romantic in a certain childlike way it was like snowing and my dad and the shadow it was like it was great so i just like to read a couple of quotes myself about the shadow by jung who really developed this notion he said the shadow becomes hostile only when it is ignored and the other thing he said is one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light but by making the darkness conscious. Mm. So basically the shadow is conscious because we're not conscious of it. Uh, I, I'm not, I said that wrong. It's not that the shadow is conscious. We need to make the shadow conscious. The shadow is darkness because we're not conscious of it. And clearly what we're talking about here is a very psychological approach 
to awakening, to say that one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light. There is a very valid path in spirituality called guru yoga or devotion, where you just go straight to the beloved. You don't worry about the dark side. You just see it all as God and go right there. Including the dark. Including the dark, but we're focusing more on the being of light. We're merging with 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 the with the guru. Uh, at the same time, that path is really much better designed for people who are really healthy psychologically, not Westerners who have a hard time psychologically, but ancient people in India who love their mommy and daddy, didn't have an iPhone and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so let's get into that because I don't think that's none of us here are probably listening to the show, right? I don't probably think we're not, not. I don't, maybe we're not ready for the next step, or at least in this conversation. So I want to bring up this other book. I don't have anything to read from it, but it's called The Drama of the Gifted Child by uh, Alice Miller. And you introduced me to this book several years ago in one of the groups you you lead, one of your I healing did. at the edge groups. I plead guilty. Yeah. And so This is not, although it's called the drama of the gifted child, and it ennobles anybody who thinks of themselves as gifted. It's not about the gifted and talented program we had in elementary school. Uh, There uh, there is a part of this that has to do with, thought it was really interesting, is that people who, uh, adults who see their childhood as a good childhood, and yet they find themselves in a psychological struggle, they they tend to say, well, there must be something wrong with me because everything went right. right. And my understanding of this is that, of course, just by the fact that one day your mother put you down and never picked you up again, you at least have some minor traumas in your life. So you recommended this book to me. That's what I got out about it. But you've also, if you would, tell me a little bit about this book and in terms of the, the stages of development and why uh, and you know how that relates to the shadow how we're, we're we have to be civilized and and what's the result of that can you talk a little yeah. bit about that well first of all it's one of the few books that changed my life uh it is a book that i think has a very poor and misleading title it's about much more than the title suggests it's about and it's a book i read back in the 60s when I was going to graduate school at Stanford and was into the consciousness explosion, it really gave me a very clear picture of the wounding that almost every child goes through, this primary wound, this fundamental wound, this core wound that happens when you realize that we're not all one, that the mother figure and you are not one, but that she's out there and she's not always perfect. So that this conversation we're going to have, or we are having maybe about the shadow, uh, is talking about parts of ourself that we don't own, that we project outward. Uh, an, an example is somebody falls in love, a woman falls in love with a guy, and she sees him as this heroic being, and they get married, and uh, she sees him as this hero. And as time goes on, uh, it, the the uh, projection begins to have a few problems in the trade. They call it the the, the projection begins to rattle. Mm-hmm. That she is she he does things that aren't always heroic. We can be telling the same story from the standpoint of the male falling in love and projecting the perfect mother onto the woman. So she tries to prop up that image and eventually sees that she can't keep doing that. Can she withdraw the projection? Can she begin to own the fact that uh, she's giving part of herself away so that as yeah. a way of denying what's been missing? These, these qualities that Alice Miller is talking about that happened very early in childhood where there is this conflict for this little child between following natural impulses and uh, keeping the parents happy, the people that feed you, house you, protect you. Uh, You're supposed to pee in certain places at certain times. You're not supposed to write on the wall. You're not not supposed to make noise when daddy's on the phone, you know, things like that. So that we tend to stuff things down and and, uh, create this shadow that uh, it's almost like we're lugging a big sack of heavy stuff around over our back. And that one way of looking at at least the initial part of spiritual practice 
is beginning to become aware of the shadow material through meditation, through devotion, eventually then become compassionate toward it, and eventually even then see it, it even that as the beloved, that even these places that we're denying and projecting are really the mother tapping us on the shoulder or tapping us on the heart maybe and saying, hey, Chris, hey, Dale, pay attention to me. Here's a part of you, you that you're not loving yet. And you can begin to do that now. So that a lot of these traditions say that we should be grateful to the enemy because he, she is showing us exactly where we're caught in our shadow, where we're lost. Mm. And of course, the the big shadow figure these days is Donald J. Trump. <laughs> it's like he, whether you I, idolize him or demonize him, either way, he's carrying the shadow. And it's very few people I meet who see beyond the shadow and just see him as a guy who's got his own stuff and and it, it doesn't get it doesn't get the person I'm talking to all upset when I say Donald Trump. People go, oh, Donald Trump, right? Right. <laughs> because he's carrying the shadow collectively for the whole country, really. Yeah. You know, there's a quote by by Alan Watts that goes something like, saints need to thank sinners. Uh, because they wouldn't think of themselves as saints, right. meaning that uh, one implies the other. Everybody who f- thinks of themselves as a good person or not Donald Trump or on the other side of the fence uh, implicitly has the other, the enemy, to uh, to thank for that self-concept. So there's a without, bit of humor in that, uh, the way he tells young. it. Yeah, but it's very true. I mean, without the sinner, we wouldn't, without the other person, we wouldn't see, it would be have a, a lot harder time seeing and admitting those places where we're caught. Sinning actually means to miss the mark. Right. The, 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 the direct translation from the Aramaic or whatever it is. And uh, we're missing the mark and by externalizing, objectifying, projecting rather than owning our experience. Yeah. Speaking about projecting and when you were talking about romantic love, uh, there is a chapter in this book that's called Shadow as Romantic Love. Uh And uh, I think people listening to this might start wondering, so am I going to get some dating advice on this podcast? (laughs) Of course, people are thinking that. And so the answer is yes. I'm going to give you some dating or perhaps some marriage advice, courtesy of this book by Robert A. Johnson. I'm going to read this uh, this paragraph here. This is really funny. Uh, He says, I had heard about a couple who had the good sense to call upon the shadow in a pre-wedding ceremony. The night before their marriage, they held a ritual where they made their shadow vows. The groom said, I will give you an identity and make the world see you as an extension of myself. The bride replied, I will be compliant and sweet, but underneath it, I will have the real control. If anything goes wrong, I will take your money and your house. (laughs) They drank champagne and laughed heartily at their foibles, knowing that In the course of the marriage, these shadow figures would eventually inevitably come out. And they were ahead of the game because they had recognized the shadow and unmasked it. That's great. That's funny. So uh, the podcast I usually do is kind of a, a spiritual meditative podcast that does bring in a lot of elements of the psychological and I'd like to try to mush those things together before we get too bogged down in, in psychology. That, I mean, this is the 21st century now, and there is a very direct way of dealing with shadow material that, that I call the tantric three-step. Can you, when you're angry, when you're scared, when you're anxious, when you're depressed, when you're narcissistic, can you begin to see how suffering is arising and begin to become aware of, particularly in your body, what does it actually feel like to be angry, as an example, rather than projecting, I am angry because of that son of a bitch in traffic. I'm angry because of that son of a bitch in politics, right? No, I'm angry. What does it actually feel like to be angry? Very seldom do we actually feel it. We project it. We get lost in the shadow. And once we can begin to actually own the shadow, reclaim the projection, and actually be with it, then eventually our heart begins to open to that part of ourself that we have disowned, given away, 
and actually have compassion, a deep wish that we be free from that suffering or this other person that we're with be free from suffering. Until so I can hear people, go ahead. No. I, I can hear people saying, uh, just in a rhetorical way, or just, uh, I can't really hear people saying this. Cool. So how do you feel it? How do you become aware of it? And I know from my perspective, I've, I've had to figure out a way to deal with it. And, and there's been a somatic method around this, uh, a sensing of it. There's also, I believe, in a, a mindfulness, being aware of, of the thoughts and then being aware uh, of uh, the sensations in the body, really feeling it. And I'm curious for you, uh, what are some examples of like when you came into this realization and, and what, what practices or how can, how can people for themselves feel it as just a, as the first step is right. that's a part of your tantric three step you're talking about. So how right. would you, how would you feel that? Maybe I could just complete the third step and then answer your question. So okay. people aren't dangling. First step is feeling it, which we're going to go into and in just a moment. Second step is having compassion for it. And when the heart opens enough through compassion, we then begin to get that even this is the beloved, that it's beyond pure and impure, that it's all sacred in some non-theistic way, that it's all the divine mother, that it's all God and his distressing disguise. So how do we do that first step? The first step is the hardest step. How do we really feel the anger or the fear instead of projecting it onto the trigger out there in the world, the, the person that's scaring us or making it, quote, making us angry, unquote. And one can go through one's whole life continuing to blame the environment for what you're feeling instead of actually owning the feelings yourself. It, it really boils down to motivation. Are you, are you tired enough of suffering that you're really willing to feel what's going on in the moment rather than blaming everybody else out there for the, the state of your life. Uh, a friend of mine who used to be the medical director at the Betty Ford Addiction Clinic wrote a book, and I forget the title of it, but the notion was if you're an adult child of an alcoholic, the operative word is adult. It's time to, okay, you had all these things when you were a kid. It makes life more difficult, but now you're grown up. Can you, can I begin to be with what's going on here in the moment. And yes, it does work temporarily to suppress or deny what we're feeling. You can yeah. put on Netflix for the rest of the night. You can have a bottle of wine or you can have a, a bad relationship for the next three years or something. But eventually, one gets to the point where you want to not suffer so much and you, you have to look at what's going on here. What does it feel like in my body when I'm angry? Right. Uh, Buddha said, the, uh, go, and, ahead, go ahead. And I want to ask you this because for myself, I was talking to a friend and I was talking about for a time when I really opened up and had a lot of grief and, and I wanted to open up to my suffering and relate to it in a new way. And he said, he said, well, if he started crying, if he allowed himself to cry, he feared that he could never stop. Right. And so my motivation or rather my belief in, in some of these practices or the ability to do these is that I can, there is, there is the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. Mm -hmm. There is a way that, that I'm just not throwing myself off the bridge. There is a support. There's something I can turn to invoke and it's more of a mystery than um than something that can be defined uh it is a, a taking kind of a connection and faith for me so for me that's what i've learned to to um that bridge that that there's some support in this has been very important to me uh and what what about you uh what has been what took you from the place of being able to recognize your suffering and then jump whole hog into it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what you said is really beautiful and is so well put. And uh, when I'm saying the first step is being able to feel things, you were very correct then going back even a step before the first step and having faith that you can take the first step. 
right? I mean, in Buddhism, as you've even suggested, before we take the first step, often one takes refuge, one invokes the Buddha, Dharma, and the Sangha. Not the historical Buddha, but the fact that freedom actually exists, that's in us already. And there is a truth, there's a way to that, and there is a the support of community. So that we often talk about the hard work of Buddhism, life is suffering, you've got to deal with all this stuff. But this is super positive assumption that you, 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 you just alluded to, that underneath it all, we are Buddha already. Right. We don't have to fix or change anything. We just have to start paying attention to why we are deluded into thinking that we're not in a certain way. Dale, and Dale, I saw a meme the other day that says, be the person who your dog thinks you are. <laughs> exactly. And, I, and I'm saying you are the person who your dog thinks you are. Any being with a clear mind and an open heart loves you. Right. That's so, my bumper sticker. It's a little bit longer. <laughs> So you keep asking me the question, I keep avoiding it, how did I get to this point myself? And uh, I suffered mightily earlier in my life. I had loving parents. I went to Berkeley and Stanford. I was at the beginning of the computer revolution. I had life made in a certain way. But I stuttered. Uh, I felt like I was just on the wrong planet. and nothing really made any sense to me. It, it, feel, it felt like I was in some weird Italian movie that the director was, it was his f first movie on the job or something like that. Hmm. So uh, I happened to be karmically lucky enough that I happened to be at Stanford right at the beginning of the psychedelic revolution, Leary and Alpert on the East Coast, Ken Kesey on the West Coast, and started taking psychedelics and I met Ramdas. And I realized there was a, that I had experiences, just temporary experiences, of being totally beyond suffering and expansive mind, partly through meditating, partly through psychedelics. And I realized that there's a whole other reality that is there. It's not a hallucination. It's not a hallucination. It's real. And I'm stuck in this conceptual framework that's very contracted and painful. And there is a way out. So that just knowing there is a way out. There was, there was another uh, deeper reality, if you will, was so affirming and, and, and uh, supportive that it, it led me to say, I, I can do this. I mean, it, it might be hard. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I'm, I'm going to do it. Okay. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, there's a quote from Joseph Campbell. I'm going to bring it up in a bit. And it, uh, there's a, quite a bit of uh, paradox in it. It was really beautiful. I was sharing it with a friend last night. And uh, however, let's, let's go back into, let's go back into uh, the beloved and the shadow. I don't know exactly where we're going to go from here. But we're going to move on from here. But continue. <laughs> Joseph Campbell got lost in the in the soup there, apparently. Right. We'll uh, <laughs> we'll edit this out. I don't know. We'll keep it here. We're gonna we're gonna uh, show you what this okay, is. Okay. So so there there was a moment of confusion there, right? Chris was going to come out with a great quote. He couldn't find it. The whole thing kind of fell apart for twenty seconds. And did that then elicit the shadow? from people who are listening to the podcast. It's like, well, I like that guy, Chris. He's, what is he doing? Can he, he, he's gonna, he's advertising quote, he can't even come up with it. What arose in you when Chris couldn't find the quote? Yeah. Could you just say, well, that just happens and you just stay in your heart or did you kind of say, he's wasting my time. Why, why can't we get, why can't we get the good stuff here? Well, hey, hey, Dale, we can't talk to those who are listening, but I'll ask you what arose in you when I was searching for that quote? Uh, I, there's part of me that hoped you get it because I could feel your slight discomfort, but I felt it was fine. This is just part of the unfolding of life here. And it's a good teaching moment. Uh, you know, I, I'm a meditation teacher and I've had people complain that during meditation, there was noise. I remember one time I was doing my podcast, uh, from up at my son's house, my son and his mother's house up in Placerville. I have this group every other 
Saturday that has like a hundred people in it. And uh, this particular day, my son's mother was gone and we had a hospice dog that was dying. And my son had to feed the dog during the time that I was leading the meditation. So he rattled around the kitchen a little bit. And the end of the meditation, somebody said, I can't believe what kind of a workshop leader are you? Podcast person here that there's all this racket in the background when we're trying to meditate. And I said, you know, when you're dying, it might be really noisy. You might be dying in a car wreck. <laughs> if if you need it to be super quiet for you to have your heart open, if you need it to be completely peaceful in the environment for you to have peace inside of yourself, you're in you're really vulnerable. You're in big trouble. So that I mean, I remember being in India at this at this uh, Burmese monastery where I was doing a lot of meditation. And it's like a really quiet place, but there was a dirt road out in front of the monastery, and you could hear an ox cart there. And an ox was pulling a cart with a bell on his neck. You could hear him like a half a mile away, ding, ding, ding. It's the only sound you could hear, but that was just as distracting as like people like banging around in the kitchen. And there's no place in the world where it's going to be the perfect environment. So that 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 person's shadow was being elicited by the fact that you couldn't f find the quote or that I, that uh, there was my son making noise when I was trying to guide a meditation or something. Yeah. That's a wonderful, this is a wonderful meta uh, improvisational moment that we're having right now. Uh, and we're, there's a quote uh, in improv that the, the mistakes get woven into the pattern of the fabric Right. And that that it becomes a part of of it. There aren't so much mistakes as as it's, it's just what it is. And uh, and I did find that quote from Joseph Campbell, and it speaks generally to what to what we're talking about. Uh, and the quote goes, "We haven't we have not even risked the adventure alone, for the heroes of all time have gone before us. The labyrinth is thoroughly known. We have only to follow the thread of the hero path." And where we had thought to find an abomination, we shall find a God. And where we had thought to slay another, we shall slay ourselves. Mm. And, where we had to thought, and where we had thought to travel outwards, we shall come to the center of our own existence. And where we had thought to be alone, we shall be with all the world. Mm. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. And when it's called the hero's journey, the part I take away from the hero is, is not that it's the hero in the traditional sense of somebody who should be praised from the outside, but it's the person who, it's all of us. Uh, but but the, the part of, I, I like the most about is the hero goes through trials and tribulations and then comes back to the community and shares what he or she is the gift that is, is brought about it. So, uh, but of course that line right there, and where we had thought to slay another, we shall slay ourselves. It has a lot to do with, uh, you know, um, am I going to make Donald Trump the enemy or am I going to deal with what comes up in me? Because uh, that's always going to be there. So the what Trump we're saying, we might be here for several generations, but, you know, what, what, we're, what we're slaying then is, is this projecting the shadow outward, that part of ourself that we're not owning. We're, that we're uh, having to protect and defend and pretend. And the, the illusory part, the part where we're, we're caught in defensiveness. Uh, going beyond the shadow, as Joseph Campbell was so beautifully saying there, has to do with loving all of ourselves, even, the, even what used to be the shadow, making conscious that which was previously unconscious. Yeah. Back to the tantric three-step, I may have uh, take a, took a divergent path there. If you were to go through the, uh, the, the three-step, could you just explain in a few, you know, in just a little bit about what it's like in an actual moment or a little series of practice for those yeah. who are curious? So there's three steps to the practice, and the three steps uh, – can be something that happened in the matter of a second or two, but it's also something that's integrated into our life over the period of a lifetime. So that in the beginning, it's something that's a state that we can 
create temporarily, but as we do it enough and create these new neural pathways, it becomes a trait. Uh, that the default is being loving, being compassionate, going beyond the shadow. Whereas in the intermediate stages of practice, we we get caught in the shadow and we have to work with it. We 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 go back to love. We go back to compassion. So. The first stage of the tantric three step is being mindful, being present, being having an embodied mindfulness of what you're going through. When you're lost in the shadow, it's painful. When you're angry, it's painful. When you're hateful, it's painful. The Buddha said that uh, believing in hate and anger is like taking poison and and thinking it's going to kill the other person. Right? <laughs> it's like it's it, it it's really hurting yourself when you're if I'm angry at Donald Trump, it's not hurting him. It's hurting me. Right. So that in the beginning, we begin to feel this doesn't feel good to be angry, to be scared, to be narcissistic. It's it's disconnecting me. It's it's making me feel contracted. But we have to admit that instead of pretending that it's the fault of everything out there. We, we, we withdraw the projections and start to feel this is what's going on, particularly in the body. And going back to Alice Miller and the early childhood stuff, uh, being embodied, getting grounded and centered, these, these energetic qualities that a small child learns between the ages of zero and two years old, inhabiting the lower chakras that, that enables you to have this stable foundation for being with all the difficult stuff that arises in our lives. And as we as we settle down, we're not busy trying to run away from suffering. As we settle into this embodied mindfulness, the heart then begins to open because we're not juggling. We're not trying to get away from things. We're just settling down and the true open nature of the mind begins to reveal itself where we not only are aware of uh, how this suffering is arising, but we're having a compassionate response to it. We're becoming more interested in the relationship with what we're feeling than even the content. Can the relationship be loving? I mean, like right now, am I more interested in what I'm saying or that I'm having a loving connection with you and trusting that if I'm having this loving connection, good stuff is going to come flowing out of my mouth? Okay, yeah. so. So you're really interested in the content. I mean, you're <laughs> erase. You're you're going beyond being fixated with the content and being interested in the relationship to the content. And then, when the heart becomes open enough, we're not so fixated on egocentric I thoughts. We be, it becomes revealed that not just our relationship with content, but the nature of content itself is sacred. There's nothing that's not the beloved. That's why the talk here is about the shadow and the beloved, that it's all the beloved. Mother Teresa, when she would take a, a beggar out of the gutter in Calcutta, would say she was seeing Christ in his distressing disguise. Can we see you, me, Trump, the neighbor, the lover, the enemy? Is Christ in his distressing disguise, Buddha in his distressing disguise, the mother in her distressing disguise? So that we're just... We're we're going beyond then even all this need to fix things that we're resting in this divine reality. There's still an I who's doing that. It's not non-duality yet, but it's this wonderful non-duality is in part two. <laughs> exactly, or in two parts. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to ask you then. Okay. Where do you find you get caught and how do you work through the shadow in your own life? Hmm. So I get caught uh, everywhere. And the, the way I know I'm caught is through this new experience I have of sensing in the body. Like I, Talking to you right now, I can be aware of how grounded am I? If I look down at my feet, I can see they're not fully touching the ground. I'm kind of pulling myself upward. My shoulders are a little bit tense. Right. And so how can I be aware? And this is both rhetorical and something I am continuing to experiment with is how can I have the presence of mind, mind to trust the ground underneath my feet and trust that 
uh, get out of the the reactions and and the way I feel if I'm working with a particular person. I, I, I have the same feelings that I have when I was in third grade of trying to be a good student and a good kid and say it right and get it right. So I realized that's still there. And so now how can I relate to it differently? Uh, am, I, are, am I answering what you're asking? Or are you looking for particular examples? No, no. I mean, I mean, basically what you're saying is that there's some underlying sense of anxiety. I mean, inadequacy, on the underlying sense of inadequacy that uh, you just assume so that you feel you have to be a good boy, you have to do better, you have to accomplish things. And uh, to be able to then be embodied and feel what it's like to feel this inadequacy, the sense of I've got to try harder, I've got to do better. It, it's, it, and how many, how many moments, how many experiences in our lives have been motivated by that feeling of not being enough right. and how painful it is. The, the, the accumulation of suffering that's happened because of the, the shadow qualities that uh, uh, convince us that we're not enough. Right. And I, I let myself off the hook for that because I think when I know better, when you know better, you do better or you can aim better in, in the sense of not even better, but uh, yeah, the, I, I think there's probably a, a sense of grief that a lot of time has been wasted. And yet that time brought me up to now and will bring me into the future. So it, uh, it's interesting about this idea that I hear people in the dating world, dating apps, they say, I want somebody who's going to make me a better person, or I'm interested in self growth. And it makes me a little sad because I think to really grow, uh, you need to accept, not resign, but somehow be with the fact, like Suzuki Roshi, you said in the previous podcast, is that what is it? everyone's perfect, but we all could use some improvement. Uh, this is very interesting to me. So I, there, there can be a little bit of self, hatred's a very strong word, but self-hatred in this idea of pursuing a spiritual path, if it's motivated by, by that. Can you tell me through your experience of working with people who want to walk this spiritual path, uh, how, how you encounter the, the, uh, the side of them that um, is at odds with themselves in that path? Yeah, well, a lot of people... The spiritual path is hard work. It's it's difficult. And one of my teachers uh, was leading a retreat, and there was a bunch of new people. He said, how many of you here in the room are new? A bunch of people raised their hands, and he said, I would suggest you leave right now. Because if you stay, it's going to be really, really difficult. And once you stay, you're not going to be able to quit. So I would I would suggest all you new people just go. Of course, nobody left. It was the perfect sales pitch, right, for, for getting people to stay. But... I got on the meditative path, as I suggested earlier, because I was suffering so much, not because I saw some intrinsic beauty in the Dharma or uh, I was just drawn to it naturally. And most people come to this path because they're suffering. They want to suffer less. There are some people who they find a, a book or a wonderful teacher and they're just drawn to it. But a great majority of people are suffering and they have some intuitive sense there's something beyond this day-to-day -day struggling with my life and love is contagious those who haven't got it catch it from those who do so that you you meet a teacher or you meet somebody in a group that's has a more open heart that than you do in fact the guru is the ultimate example of that 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 is then inspiring you hey there is another way of being in the world here's somebody who's has this wide open heart and my heart keeps closing. I want to be like that. What does it take for me to be like that? So it does take strong motivation. And I would say that a lot of people start the spiritual path from a sense of inadequacy and I've got to fix myself, but that as, as, as practice progresses more and more, the effort changes into the effort to receive and surrender rather than to fix and do and and change. That 
as we as we keep bringing attention and embodiment to the present moment, it begins to reveal the underlying wholeness, the 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 sense of integration and connectedness that we have with each other. As and in fact, from the standpoint of tantra, there's just one reality. There's one consciousness. It's not like we're all individuals perceiving separate objective reality out there. That. There's one consciousness that's flowing through Chris and flowing through Dale and flowing through everybody here and filtering things and seeing things differently. But consciousness is creating reality rather than we're collecting it through our perceptual mechanisms. So it takes great courage. And courage comes from the French root word core, meaning heart, to be willing to look at this stuff, to be willing to open yourself to the places where we're narcissistic, the places where we're cowardly, the places where we're judgmental. But the, there is a, a joy that goes beyond happiness and sadness. One of my teachers I just read said that compassion is the, is the combination of joy and sadness. Right. And There's, would you say that people, including myself, uh, we either want to you could see a, a spiritual path as I want to be happier, the psychological thing of I want to be happier. But then I've heard Ram Dass and others and perhaps yourself say whether or not you want to be happy or free. Uh, would you say that you would use that word free? And what would it mean to be free versus happy? Um, okay, so I think everybody everybody wants to be happy. And you come to spiritual practice wanting to be happier. But what you might begin to notice after a while is that if you're grasping at happiness, you're having to compare and judge experiences. Is this a happy-making experience or a not happy-making experience? So there were kind of one conceptual step removed from intimate connection with arising experience. Whereas if we're trying to find truth of the moment, what's real right now? We don't care if it's happy making or sad making or unhappy making, then uh, eventually happiness is a byproduct of that. Hmm. So it's kind of, it's almost like a paradox there. If, as, if we grasp at happiness, it creates a, a contractedness, a judgmental nature, if you will. If we just say, I want reality unfiltered. I want to, I want to be making love with my life as it's arising. Uh, then the heart and the mind relax, they open, and there's even then a joyfulness that goes beyond happiness and sadness. I think it's completely reasonable to be sad, to be angry about what's going on in the world right now. However, we don't need to get lost in those emotions. Mm -hmm. So there's a very big difference between feeling sad and being lost in sadness. I've said this thing again and again that in English, we say, I am afraid. In Spanish, we say, I have fear. In Tibetan, fear is here. So that's just the way we think in language. In English, we, we get lost. It's so much easier to get lost in emotions. I am angry. I am. No, you're not. It's just a, just a passing mind-body state. <laughs> so, Chris, we're, we're reaching the end of our time limit here. Yeah, and Dale, this has been a very happy making experience for me. <laughs> has this been a happy making experience for you? Well, I'm laughing. It must something must be happening. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for everybody for tuning in. Until next time. Love you. Love you. Take care. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye.